At KU, Madame Alain speaks about musical structure and expression which she wishes her students to understand. For instance, when we play a fugue, it's necessary to know, to analyze the fugue and to know where the entrees are and to show where they are. And when you have a cadence and the music starts again, you should breathe to show the people the construction of the piece. You cannot play it all straight. It's not because it's 18th century music that the sense of rubato doesn't exist. I told them that there's a rubato with fine mentions of rubato even in Monteverdi's work. 17th century, the tempo rubato always existed. So when you play at the organ, the tempo rubato is not only permitted, it's, it's, it's a must. But you must know how to use it. You don't use it the same way in Bach music, in Liszt music, in César Franck music, and in modern music. It's different according to the style of the music. But sometimes you feel it. If you think of singing style, you will think that sense of rubato. You cannot avoid it, because a voice going up, that, that makes a crescendo. And the higher notes are a little more in size than the lower notes. So you must follow a melody, and you must know even at the organ that is supposed to be a very stiff instrument. You must, at the organ, show that sense of melody. Because it has no importance, but repeat that there. <laughs> The rubato is being able to come back tempo primo afterwards. You are a bit too slow, you know. You, it's, it's the same thing as we had. Come back at a boat. Yeah. The tempo is not steady enough. And I know it's rubato. But you know what tempo rubato means in Italian? It means stolen tempo. You have stolen something. And what you have stolen, you, can, you should give it back. That means, that, yeah, it's true. It, exactly that. Exactly the meaning of the tempo rubato. And when you had an accelerant do, you should slow down afterward and come back at tempo. And the difficulty is that your rubato must not be wild. You must not steal the tempo and not give it back afterward. So you have to accelerate in some places, provided that you know how to come back in your right tempo. So of course, I ask you to play it a little faster than you were used to. But also think that this piece that seems made a, out of little section is really a, a piece that is built up from the beginning to the end. There was a quotation of uh, César Franck to uh, um, his student um, da Vincent Dandy. He said, in that choral, you know, the choral is not what you think it is. It's it built itself all along the piece. The choral is built itself all, all along the piece. So we are still in the style of the choral. But now we are making some embroidery, some, uh, some little <laughs> variation around it. But we must not be able to find the tempo again. It's why I ask you to play this place again. Maybe less rubato. No, I don't, I don't want, but, but the rubato must be controlled.
And there are also phrasing marks. Da 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 dum, ba da da dum, ba da da dum. And you also have this crescendo and this decrescendo. And this gives a kind of a rubato. If you do the 12 bars at the same time, take your time. It introduces what is to come there. Let's begin with da 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 And you close the box on the third beat. It's very clearly indicated in all the manuscripts. Because it's andante no, it's not uh, andante. Andante no means, yes. Oh, and you see, uh, just to give you the example. Both in New York and Kansas, she answered questions from the audience. How has your playing changed over the years? It 
changed all the time, you know. I have run so <laughs> many times, and I was so lucky having had such a long life as an organist and having always been in around organist. So I knew the last Cavalier Corps, you know, and the, the, the fight for the neoclassic organ and the renewal of uh, the playing of uh, early literature. Then I knew the Baroque era. I knew the, the coming of the practice performance, new finger, uh, early fingerings, uh, Nicole Valliot at the organ, and the uh, harpsichord. Uh, the way it seemed had changed so much for chamber music, and I have done lots of chamber music. So that also changed my view, my insight into music. And uh, I went on learning new things, reading new books, listening to many people. I was fortunate enough to, to travel very much, to see all the, uh, to play all different organs in Europe, to be acquainted with German literature, with the Dutch organs, the wonderful Dutch organs, the Italian organs, Austrian organs, an organist as well, and I many organi friend organists from all countries. <coughs> of course, I came very often to your country as well, and I enjoyed it very much. So I had many new experiences, and I was always trying to undertake an evolution. And even now, I can tell you, I, I am still learning new things. My playing is not what it was, at, not at all what it was 40 years ago. I have, I have, I always have a certain will for freedom in playing, playing musical. It's, uh, you cannot have to listen to that in my class. I want organists to make music and not to play notes. And I want the keyboard of an organ to be a musical instrument and not something you push the notes in. <laughs> but you must learn how to push the notes <laughs> the right way <laughs> and to release them. That is also very important. A few people have recorded um, the whole works of Bach as many times as mm. you have. I wonder if you ever listen to any of the old ones and say, oh, I wish I hadn't done it that way. No, not so much, you know. There were different periods of my life, and uh, some of the records that I did a long, long time ago, of course, I don't agree with the registration anymore, but the feeling is still there, and I think, oh, wow, well. <laughs> it was not that bad. <laughs> yes, I think I can do better now, but I still sort of enjoy my old recordings. <laughs> But I don't listen to them very often. <laughs> me. Thank you. Well, at, at what point in your career did you begin teaching? Oh, very, very early, because uh, I needed money. <laughs> 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 so I first I taught um, I taught music to young kids. I hated it. And <laughs> little by little, I got good organ students, and uh, the moment I ha have good organ students, I just loved it. And I learned many things from my students as well. Teaching is really a school for the, for the student, but for the teacher as well. Because many of my students showed me new things, asking questions, asking questions, and some, that was a, a time uh, when I began ha really having very good students, that was in the, in the late 50s, early 60s, the, the time of the renewal in Baroque playing. So everybody was very much involved in those problems, and it was good to discuss with young people. And I especially enjoyed uh, the Organ Academy in Harlem, where I went, I don't know how many times, every summer, <coughs> lots of students from all countries, and the teachers were Anton Heiler, Luigi Tagliavini, and uh, Gustav Leonard, and myself. And the four of us made a marvelous team. We had many meetings together, and we had the opportunity of learning very much one from the other, and exchanges between different countries and different cultures. That was very, very important. Could you share some memories of your brother, Jean Alain, that you have that maybe either yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. You know, my first memories of Jean Alain is of 
flood of music coming over my head. The house was so much designed with the organ in the lower level. In the first level, <coughs> I was living with my mother. And on the second level, there were several pianos for the Allen children to practice. So my father was teaching at the organ, and we could hear the organ. And Jean was practicing the piano on the higher level. And I tell you, it was a flood of music. So every time I could escape, I climbed up to his room. And that was a wonderful place, <coughs> because he was not only a marvelous musician, but he was also a wonderful drawer. And <coughs> it was like a dream. On the wallpaper, he has painted lots of figures, lots of uh, very uh, unusual people that he had dreamt of, and some <coughs> paintings of ancient poetry and things like that. It was really just out of this world. So he, say, he, he, he was very good with kids. So he told me, oh, just keep quiet. I am, I am practicing, so I kept quiet. Say a word about Jacques and your children. I don't think everybody knows that you have two children and six grandchildren. <laughs> so after six years in the Conservatoire of Paris, when I graduated, and I, also, I knew a certain voice and a certain amount of time, so we have waited. We were very good. We waited for me to, to graduate, and we got married. Well, and my husband was a tremendous help because he did all the management and all the, he, he had me understood very well that my, my music was the most important thing for me. I warned him, I told him, you know, I, will, I can marry you, but I, I will remain a musician. He said, oh, yes, I know that. <laughs> I accept. <laughs> so I had two children, six years apart, and uh, no musicians, but, um, all of them did very well. My son is a big engineer. He has three children, four children, sorry. And my daughter is now writing, graduated in history. And uh, she is a doctor at La Sorbonne now, doctoral dissertation on the life of Albert Alain, because she's preparing a big book on the life of Jean Alain. We, we need a good biography by Jean, of Jean Alain that my daughter is now on her way to publish. Well, let's hope, but I am very happy with my children and still more happy with my grandchildren because my daughter has also two children. <laughs> so that makes lots of big boys and girls <laughs> that I enjoy very much seeing. So I am very lucky having been able to be a musician, to travel, and nevertheless have a family and enjoy my family. <laughs> Was your mother a musician? No, no, fortunately, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she was a very cultured person. She had a wonderful memory, could quote lots of poetry, of text from memory. And uh, she gave us a very good, uh, wide open culture on literature, poetry, and uh, art in a general fashion. I was Lucky enough, thanks to my family, because my, fa my father knew all the big organists of his time, and my brother, the, big organ the greatest organist of his time, to listen to my home, such people as uh, Marcel Dupré, as Maurice de Reflé, Jean Langlais, Gaston Littes, André Fleury, and people like that, and André Marchal, who was a great friend of my father and to benefit of advices from all these people when I was myself becoming an organist. So you see, I've, I have been raised in the world of the organ, and uh, I'm still in the world of the organ, and I enjoy it. <laughs> all I wish for you is to, is to enjoy life and enjoy making music as much as I always did in my life. That's my wish for you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.